So guys, uh, my presentation, maybe you saw it from the Facebook page, it's uh, on memory and basically my personal semantic take on something that is called episodic memory. And today what I would like to share is just uh, a glimpse or one aspect of my current research problem that I'm uh, addressing. So it's basically a work in progress as everything in semiotics. So it's subject to change and to evidence, of course. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share this cute picture of this Californian scrub jay. Uh, it's one species of COVID family that basically is used for these experimental studies that test episodic memory in non-human animals. Uh, but the thing that I'm going to present is aimed to be able to explain not only episodic memory in COVIDs, but also in some apes and in some rodents. That's far as the evidence, experimental evidence, goes nowadays. Like actually tested animals um, is a very limited amount of species. But the uh, background hypothesis is that if it is the case that COVID apes and uh, rodents have episodic memory, make most likely uh, the rest of the uh, family species, so to speak, of those animals also possess episodic memory because environmental, uh, sorry, ecological demands and so on. But anyhow, um, so this is um, the Californian scrubjay, and it's famous because uh, its feeding behavior, basically what it proves or it relies on a subjective awareness of change, and more accurately, spatial temporal change. Uh, this species is not only aware of when different food items expire earlier than others, they also anticipate uh, when those items will expire, and according to that information, or remembering that information, they will no longer retrieve the food because they know it will be like expired. So to uh, and this could be uh, experimented with, with crickets, with worms, with um, uh, this little nuts that I forgot the name. Uh, anyhow, so this is just um, a reminder of more or less the context of uh, why this is tested in these birds. And the thing that I'm going to discuss has like a background that I will be just briefly, briefly commenting. So in this field of pathology, zoology, uh, the cognitive sciences, that is episodic memory, uh, scientists basically have dealt with a, a lot of uh, issues trying to explain how um, uh, non-human animals remember. And so what I did in this uh, paper is to go through those problems, and one of them, spoiler alert, is the, uh, what is it like to be a bad problem. And basically I go over all the limitations and all the obstacles that the experimental approaches face when it comes to how to make an interpretation out of the behavior that we can observe from these living beings. And basically what I argue in this paper is that, um, generally speaking, the attitude that is taken towards these living beings when it comes to evaluating their episodic memory capacities is that uh, some scientists, what they do is that they address animals as if they were hypocampal amnesiacs, but they don't have like a long-term memory of their own meaningful experiences. And also that they are basically uh, mindlessly acting episodically, nonetheless, uh, but acting just on the basis of uh, a mysterious, inexplicable you know, cognitive system uh, that is behind their episodic actions. So anyhow, so there's a whole debate there, and the thing that I'm going to show today is what comes after these uh, gaps have been um, evaluated. What do we do next? At least from semiotics. Um, so my current research is um, dealing with how to provide a biosemiotic model. Yes. Um, a biosemiotic model that incorporates this evidence that they have according to how memory actually works in this type of animals. Uh, I will just shut up for a minute, uh, so you can take a look at the diagram, let the design uh, make its job, and you can read it peacefully, and then we'll be coming back to explain. Um, 
comments later. Hmm? Just I have a brief comment about this. May I? Of course. Say, uh, I have seen that you sent it me earlier. My uh, just uh, view is that this is very beautiful. There are many, many areas to uh, insert it here. Very, very nicely. However, one thing is, uh, uh, say, sort of uh, problematic. Because one cannot see from here the, the, that irreducibility of triads. Say, uh, uh, this is, these are all in a row. And uh, say, do you, can you comment about that? Or uh, maybe that irreducibility here is just uh, not relevant? Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, this is the preliminary version of the diagram. Uh, because I don't know yet a way to express uh, this irreducibility. But in that case, if you make at least triangle like of that, mm -hmm. then it would be yeah. already better it could in work. that sense, but or something what all three share or something, mm -hmm. because then now, uh, as you say, nothing is what all three share, except so, sort of material, right, right. which is not that. So, so maybe rather than, than, rather than the mapping of uh, the irreducibility of the relations here, it's more about the sequentiality and causality behind it. And I will be explaining that through these little arrows that I hope you can see uh, in a moment. So yeah, uh, now that you took a look, basically what I'm doing here is trying to propose uh, this biosemiotic terminology that we already have, uh, this very uh, developed, so to speak, in that language for addressing uh, phenomena in nature and living uh, systems, but that these neurocognitive studies in animal memory haven't used for whatever number of reasons. Uh, and let's start with firstness. What we know as firstness in, at least in percent semiotics, what do you think? Uh, okay, so evidence, according to evidence, her, the world of firstness in memory is the world of sensory memory. Uh, and that is species specific, of course. Every organism, every species has its own, so to speak, in and that, or their own umbilical. Uh, and of course, the sensory subsystems of every species will, in a way, determine or influence which representations they can actually feel, which uh, sensorial interpretations they can actually uh, afford. Uh, but this is just more or less a genetic term that they use uh, sensory memory to refer to perception in animal memory. Without the capacity, the possibility to experience and to feel and to retain sensorial input for some milliseconds, there wouldn't be a next threshold for memory. This is the first uh, threshold, threshold of memory, so to speak, that is needed to speak about memory, at least according to experimental evidence. And the way, the reason that I situated in between uh, secondness, and, sorry, secondness and thirdness, is uh, because in this case, we could think of uh, as a functional cycle, like inspired by uh, Hugh School's functional cycle model, we can see this as a bidirectional sequentiality that is uh, irreducible. In the sense that qualia is perceived as persons. This formal cause of memory that is just present, uh, as Bert would say, as persons. But of course, the story doesn't end there and cannot be analyzed just separately uh, in this uh, imaginary realm of sensory experiences. Uh, the model what it's trying to convey is the fact that the only way for an episodic interpreter or an episodic living being, such as an ape, a corby, or uh, so on, is to have the three uh, spheres of memory incorporated. Okay, so I move to seconds. Um, so, in terms of evidence, Secondness, this efficient causality or this actual correlation between uh, perception and actions is this, and it's called procedural memory. Uh, some authors call it differently, but generically speaking, procedural memory is this automatic capacity that we have to react, not act, but to react somehow uh, to what we have uh, in our attention in the working memory. So anyhow, this is all the actions that we can actually measure, see, make interpretations out of, of these living beings uh, by the procedural memory. So the thing is, with the previous um, debate that I was uh, showing you earlier, is that 
historically speaking, uh, the interpretations of their actions has just has been confined to this uh, realm. They only want to measure like uh, actions and choice making, but in terms of how they actually physically behave, right? But what has been left out of this whole uh, functional cycle of memory, so to speak, is for me the most important and explanatory sphere of memory. That is final causality. In other words, uh, teleology. This teleological or teledynamical, as maybe we would put it, uh, aspect of memory that makes it so that by the sensory capacities that our sens uh, senses grant us, we can actually uh, take actions on based on that what we are aware of. But anyhow, uh, so when it comes to terms, in this case, evidence tells us that in animal memory, uh, episodic memory and semantic memory are the systems or the subsystems responsible for connecting this intentionality or this goal-oriented uh, memorization for the rest of the types of memory. Uh, so without this type of uh, goal-directed intentionality, of course we wouldn't have uh, the actions that are after uh, that intentionality. And those actions are usually feeding behavior and trouble uh, tool using problem solving behavior and so on. So, evidence basically showing that uh, memory is a theological uh, thing, not only like a behavioral or effective or material uh, thing going on. Okay, so when it comes to the material causality going on here, uh, in the cognitive sciences, this uh, core network would be the material cause that actually makes it possible for these two types of memory and our uh, perceptive capacities to exist. Uh, without the central nervous system and the core network, we wouldn't be able to actually perceive and to actually uh, command our body through procedural memory. Because um, the other side of material causality memory would be the somatic nervous system, basically. Uh, this other part of the nervous system that basically allows us to take controlled actions based on our working memory. Uh, so, okay, a lot of terminology here, but my point here is just to walk you through more or less the geography of this diagram. That is basically um, saying that, okay, there are three spheres or there are three ways we can uh, understand different aspects of memory, but the three of them are uh, in conjunction and in a sequence, a bidirectional sequence, uh, can account better for the evidence that scientists usually just evaluate in behavioral terms. Um, okay. Um, oh, by the way, yes. This word over here, virtual habits, is a terminology that comes from person semantics, uh, Professor Donna West. Some of you know her. She proposes a uh, term because she researches episodic memory in animals. She's proposing this term to speak about this type of episode building that mentally happens in episodic interpreters. Uh, so basically, it means the capacity to re experience or to reactivate something that in neurocognitive sciences is called the pattern reinstall pattern reinstatement of the whole network. So to be able to re-experience or to recreate those qualia in function of what they wanted to do or they want to do, and then uh, have this virtual habit in mind, and the culmination of the virtual habit is, of course, action, goal-oriented uh, goal action. Um, virtual habits last a lifetime because episodic memory and semantic memory are long-term memories. We technically cannot get rid of them until we, unless we forget or we have amnesia. Uh, sensory memory usually lasts less than two milliseconds. Uh, although in animals that's not very well researched, at least in humans it's two milliseconds. But it's hard to say in some animals uh, actually what the threshold would be. And of course, uh, control behavior is demonstrated that you cannot, as we cannot as animals, pay attention continuously for more than one minute to whatever thing we're doing consciously. That's why we need, uh, of course, other types of uh, non dependent types of memory and automatic memory. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time. 
choices. Next, um, okay, so in short, what I'm trying to also explain here is that uh, forget everything you know about memory in the so to speak anthropocentric like, sense, uh, because memory is not a single entity, it's more like three uh, spheres, and the way that I'm modeling here those spheres is that this one would be so to speak, the teleological sphere, this would be the phenomenological sphere, and that would be the neurocognitive or behavioral type of sphere that are usually somehow in the literature connected, sorry, not connected in this way. Um, so what does this model can provide in these gaps in animal memory studies? Uh, so basically what I'm doing is that they uh, stop explaining these experiments this is the most interesting part for me. Uh, they speak of content, structure, and flexibility. Uh, those are like the standard experimental criteria for testing episodic memory in living beings. And the way these three uh, concepts experimentally relate according to data and evidence is nonetheless, uh, sorry, not other than suggest. This is to say it is irreducible, it is Directly uh, speaking, well, I have trouble with the word, but the content in this case, uh, the intentionality, is the one driving the connection between how the structure, sorry, how the experience is in, like, sensorily encoded as a structure, and how it is flexibly expressed during experiments that test the behavior. Um, in other words, what I'm doing here is to connect our own method. Semitic, biosemitic meta language with the experimental uh, criteria that these experiments already have as a standard. And what I'm arguing, or what I will be arguing with this model, the paper that comes out of it, is that we can, in fact, uh, use the model to explain the evidence that they already have uh, according to these experiments. And my only contribution here would be uh, to basically elaborate these little things here, uh, these three dimensions of semantic analysis, so to speak, that, go, that could go deeper into all those three spheres, sorry, uh, those spheres, uh, in terms of pragmatics, syntactics, and semantics. And so far so good? OK. So, oh, thanks. Uh, still in the process. Okay, let me start for a second. Mm. I can see the uh, interpret on basis of the virtual habits, definitely. Mm -hmm. I could also see how Donna would also agree with this. I guess I'm a little caught up on the choice of final causality and teleology specifically mm -hmm. to describe virtual habits. Mm -hmm. You probably already sense that, that can get you in a little trouble. Mm. From the science, from the scientists. Yes, of course. Uh, I've heard comments that uh, they don't want to go into the, they don't want to discuss intentionality uh, in living beings and such. Right. Uh, but that's one of the gaps or the epistemological gaps that this model is trying to really address because it's kind of uh, accounting for episodic behavior in terms of episodic awareness and also historic intentionality, and in other words, is the capacity to act on the basis of spatial temporal scenarios that are not here, like non-present times. Yes, uh, okay. I get that from virtual habits. Yeah, and uh, in case you're interested, so the virtual habits the concept, basically it's uh, Donald West's semiotic take on Stenefeld's natural propositions, and basically virtual habits means that iconicity and indexicality together, they assert arguments. Um, in this case, habits. And that's why the irreducibility aspect of the diagram is yet to be mapped accordingly. Uh, but I can take care of that in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, the idea about triangles instead of circles is such an elegant, <laughs> elegant way to solve the problem. I only, again, the intention fine, virtual habits fine, so on and so on. But why uh, stake your claim on teleology? it's not the same as the 
I mean, mm-hmm. having intention is not the same as, as teleology. Okay. Teleology so, brings along with it all sorts of stuff. Okay, okay. Right? So, can we already make some comment on that? No? No, no, I was just saying uh, it's correct to make difference between teleology and, uh, you know, some kind of goal directedness of a single organism. Yes. Mm. And that makes a lot of difference. Then it would be, you know what, teledynamics. Yes, rather. Yeah. Or, uh, You're already on safer ground if you restrict it to that, although the problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I like what you're trying to do with Aristotle. That's fun. That's fun. So, as a conclusion to speak, because I would like to hear your feedback and your questions, is um, okay, now that we have uh, found these epistemological gaps in animal studies, uh, and now that I can propose these biosemantic models, mapping those experimental criteria with the ones that we observe in theory, according to the evidence, uh, what comes next? So the idea for me is to somehow uh, use this model or new version of it uh, to make like a case study out of uh, maybe, maybe corporate episodic memory, maybe rodent episodic memory, or maybe eight episodic memory. Uh, and most likely it's going to be done just by picking one already existing uh, experimental study and just basically reinterpreting the whole thing to this. Uh, so that would be the next step to pick like a concrete particular species out there that have been studied far beyond doubt, and just trying to see if this model can actually uh, account for this continuity between intentional facts, sorry, intentional um, virtual habits, uh, this specific awareness, and this control behavior that otherwise has been mapped uh, in computational terms. I will just briefly show you one so this is the biosemantic map of memory, so to speak. This is the traditional map of memory um, that we have nowadays. And you can still find it in some books here. Uh, it's basically like a storage model, uh, basically saying, of course this is human uh, memory, but it also applies to some uh, animal species, because the rest of the models are based on human. Uh, but this is not actually mapping or explaining uh, this semantic absolute that I observe in the expression of episodic behavior. That otherwise would be just, ah, okay, cute, uh, these animals can anticipate the future and remember the past and act accordingly. But we cannot make any claims on that, so we will be just saying that they uh, don't remember the past and the future, and they just act for uh, an alternative series of non episodic mechanisms. Uh, so yeah, in case you want to know more, I mean, even after the question session, I would love to redirect you to the paper that I just showed you in a moment ago. Um, yeah, because everything I would say is expanded. Uh, so thank you. Now please, questions and comments. I thought it was 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of discussion. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so please, comments, questions, yeah. please. So, I really like that you put this contradiction with the traditional memory of schema. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a cost book from three to algorithm, and I have mm-hmm. the impression that this is what you're trying to do to transform the, the three life diagram into some kind of more labyrinth like. No. This, no. this actually is. Also, uh, at least to me, it seems if it's the same mechanism, like it is a three life because there is no full sequence, it's just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 180 degrees turn, uh, three like one more. Mm-hmm. So, I would also maybe suggest uh, some non sequential order in your diagram to make it more explicit that you want to transform the traditional um, memory diagram. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, so one thing with this map uh, is that I did it this way, first because we read, or most people read from left to right, and it's easier to intuitively understand.
understand that, okay, now this is the sphere like kind of directing the first time arrow of the sphere. And actually, if you look into Peirce's writings, uh, he speaks about the three temporal stages or expressions of temporal reality. Uh, one of them is precedence, and he connects precedence with thirdness. Uh, because thirdness is somehow already the uh, continuity or the conjunction of firstness and secondness. And in terms of phenomenology or phenomenology of time, uh, yeah, this qualia is this simultaneity of perceived qualities that we are just like experiencing in the moment. The phenomenal presence somehow. Although that's of course a uh, kind of different topic. Uh, and then this, after that, we have, so to speak, the outcome, the control uh, behavior of this uh, whole process. So in a sense, it is sequential, so that's why I want to preserve the linearity of it. But it's also, of course, uh, bidirectional. So once that the exotic agent has been, uh, or is actually solving a problem, feeling whatever, uh, they get real-time input of their actions in the world out there. Uh, so they, of course, uh, rearrange their behavior according to that input. So that's why we can also perceive our actions and we can also change according to that. But, um, so no level then. But definitely he reduces the risk. Yeah. Yeah, it just said to me, I can't really understand how to connect irreducibility with the sequential order. This is to me a bit contradictory, but maybe after reading your paper, maybe it will be more clear. And then... mm, yeah, hopefully. Um, I think about it. And what about the, the Charles Morris uh, terminology? Can you explain why oh, that yeah. is? Um, yeah, uh, so basically, okay, so you know that I use interpretant here, interpretant here, probably there. So, this is suggesting that the causality of memory is synergies, is synergies based, so to speak. And that uh, maps or reflects on the fact that, uh, as far as I know, they don't have yet a type of subfield that studies these three things, like specifically those things. And the only way I can come up with a terminology for us to understand how to study that is because, of course, pragmatics uh, studies the relationship between interpretant and representant, right? How interpretant makes use of the representants for whatever reason. So that's why I call it chrono pragmatics. That, of course, uh, comes from versus grammar, proper. Stipulative grammar. Uh, syntactics would be, of course, uh, the dimension of synergies that I studied the relationship between representants and other representants. Uh, that, that's why in the cognitive sciences they call that structure. Because according to them, there is some sort of, uh, for the organisms to call explicitly the temporal relationships in their mind. And the only way they can express that is structures, but um, for me, it is representative and native experiences. And uh, of course, semantics would be the relationship between the representant and the thing uh, that is absent. The thing that the representant, in a way, is bringing into the equation that is no actual here. Uh, so that's the only logical way that I could think of for trying to propose the terminology and say, okay, uh, we can study that in semantics. It's just that we um, use weird words. Um, but it's basically what they are already you know, we're researching, but uh, under a different epistemology and a different, uh, more Cartesian, computational type of thing. That doesn't take into account usually what the episodic agent wants or what the episodic agent uh, is looking for. So, yeah, um, I hope it makes sense. Okay. Please. Uh, apologies for. Your question is not about the content at all, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, but about the beauty of the scheme. Uh, say, uh, what's the explanation of the color code? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, it's more didact didactic than another because I studied one. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually, I don't know, maybe it's easier for the eye to see, like, okay, the transition between blue and purple and red. Um, but it's just for aesthetic quality. 
I would uh, just uh, suppose the better one uh -huh. uh, related to because this is the spectrum of uh, periods, that means frequencies. So, in case of visual spectrum, the higher frequency, that means milliseconds, uh -huh. uh, would be violent, true, uh, but the longest one uh, that would be uh, red. So, so red here? Red, yeah, red. Uh, what is in between the current period should be some something from from there. Maybe maybe then green. Uh, while of course material causality that cannot be other than black. <laughs> I I like the course of yeah. Just, sorry. <laughs> so, is there no more questions? Should we move on to your presentation? Uh, of course. I really like I like this kind of ad hoc, uh, complicated stuff thrown it all together. Really like it from a theoretical perspective, especially if, if your only ambition was a theoretical. Uh, then it's very interesting to categorize everything respective to everything else. But since your ambition is indeed to apply it to mm -hmm. empirical studies, mm -hmm. in that case, it could be that the, as operational as possible, thus as simple as possible, and there's some elements, that's why I drew our attention to the teleology. The okay. aspect of including teleology, for example, in it, is mm -hmm. that if you include too much stuff like that, then it can become quite uh, impractical for, for the purposes of, of parsing empirical studies. And that's the, that's the motive for simplicity, I guess. Yes. Because your ambition is indeed to apply it in a very concrete way to empirical studies. Yeah, you may get. That's why we point out that you may get in trouble with some of these really philosophically loaded uh, elements of the diagram. So, do you think that uh, the dynamics would be a safer way? I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Yes, please. Uh, uh, just a friendly one. Of course. Uh, uh, when you uh, read books by uh, the practical psychopathology. Then, as there is some uh, see, diagnosing or just the sort of correlations of uh, drawings people are doing and uh, psychic pathology. Mm -hmm. And it occurs that um, schizophrenics tend very often to draw the figures which try to connect all the world in one figure. Same. Uh, same. That me. Uh, <laughs> that say, of course. I think that is a very nice idea to try at certain uh, certain stage of of this uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. Everybody, actually, every creative person will do so as you. Uh, but before becoming to the stage of publication, say, this might be reasonable to. Uh, make it simple to remove some of these uh, triads from there because it's uh, certainly so that if you look on the definitions of those, how they are introduced, so they do not fit in this way exactly. You have, say, extended something and then uh, well, narrowing some others, in that way you indeed can do so. But in order to have a more powerful, even, and practical device as uh, here, I think it's, it might be at the next stage now, after going through this uh, truly synthetic, say, to make it uh, a bit less inclusive. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. This is uh, the goal, to make a diagram rather than a conceptual map. Uh, so, yeah, basically, who is to have Critically, to, to go the through all these, uh, maybe not all these are required. And uh, say, of course, here you would like to put the uh, fourfold classification of Aristotle together with threefold the first and so on. Uh, say, and you can find a way. Uh, say, but uh, yeah. Coming back to the schizophrenia, <laughs> uh, have you seen this diagram by right first? No. No. Diagram of the heat. And basically, I think this is Persis most ambitious of what happened. Diagram. Um, 
It's Persis? Yeah, it's Persis. I mean, uh, I don't know the actual uh, source of the manuscript. I think it is the image. Uh, yeah, 52. Uh, so, the in yeah. interesting graphically, it reminds yeah. uh, almost one to one Manfred Eigen's uh, hi hypercycle. Manfred Eigen, who was one who just made a general biological description of reproduction or a reproducible, self reproducible system. So, his, his one is uh, yeah, graphically the well. <laughs> I recommend you to go and check it out because if someone wants to ask schizophrenic in the sense it was birth. And okay, just one last annotation here. So uh, the temporal expressions of stage, resilience, contemporaneity, and subsidence, the way he develops that uh, in some of the uh, manuscripts or writings is according to my model or what I try to reflect, and I, I still have to explain that. Uh, is the following. The simplest way to map all this is firstness in between thirdness and secondness. Uh, that's a classic way to map it. The thing here is this little bidirectional arrow <laughs> that basically is indicating that okay, it's a triadic irreducibility, but it's also a bidirectional sequence. Because this is uh, a processual thing that goes over time. That's basically um, the argument behind that. Uh, thank you for the. We still have a lot of work to do for the paper. <laughs> I mean, I have to do it. <laughs>